I want to make a quick announcement about turning in homework. So I had a couple of people email me this morning, super last minute, like, hey, I can't make it to campus. Here's pictures of my homework. Obviously, you all are here, so you're not the ones who did that. And I will accept it this time because I didn't specifically make a statement about it. But if you need to turn in a digital version of your homework because you're going to be traveling, because you're sick, or you're not going to be on campus, email me and the TAs 24 hours in advance and let us know, okay? Because if you just email me at the last minute and say, here's pictures, I can give you the hard copy later, then we post the solutions right after lecture, right? So we have to look at your pictures, look at the hard copy, just to make sure you haven't changed anything in the hard copy that you're turning in, and grade that, and get it with the rest of the stack of homeworks later. Or we have to print off like your grainy iPhone pictures and then grade those, okay? Either way, it's kind of annoying. So let us know, and if you need to submit it digitally, that's fine, and we'll figure out the best way for you to do that, okay? Yeah. Is there a way that we could have a Dropbox so we could submit early? Yeah, if you guys, do you guys want me to put a Dropbox in the TA room? Yeah. Okay, I can do that. The biggest reason I hadn't done that is because I have to have Abby like lurking there to like grab them all at 1030, which is fine. We can, we can do that. Abby or Shin can get them like all at 1030, but it's... Is there a, like a? We'll just have we'll just have the TA grab them right at ten thirty. Yeah. If you want a timestamp to be like extra sure, then that's fine. Okay. So homework, hard copy in class at the start of class, or in the TA Dropbox before the start of class. If you need to submit it digitally. Let us know 24 hours in advance for a good reason. Okay, good? All right. Okay, questions on anything? Material we've covered so far, recitation problems. Any particularly hard homework problems? Yes. Sorry? 5B. 5B, okay. Um, there are a couple of people who asked me about number five, and I'm going to try and save like 10 or 15 minutes at the end of lecture and go over it. Yes? When there are new um, like cues that come up or new like other symbols, can you write the, um, like just what it is on the page as a definition? Sure. Like yeah, I'll try to be really rigorous about doing that. Yeah. I did write down like all of the nomenclature. And I was gonna try and go over that, just like a little recap. Okay. Okay, so I think probably the biggest thing that we really need to spend some time on right now is talking about our sign conventions, right? We're all like a little bit confused about that. Yeah, okay, it's confusing. Okay, and when we're just talking about conduction, it doesn't really matter. We don't have to be like as rigorous about it because you're just like, oh, heat's flowing this way, and then I know it's this amount. Okay, but when we start having combined conduction and convection problems, it gets really confusing if you don't, if you're not super rigorous about the way you're defining your sign conventions. So we're gonna try and lay it all out. So everything is clear, and there's kind of one method that we can apply to always have the sign convention correct. And then the math will always give us, you know, kind of the, the correct temperatures based on that. Okay. Let's start with uh, some conduction examples first. So for all of these examples, I'm just going to have like a plain wall, one temperature on one side, one temperature on the other side. So we've got a wall here. And then kind of the key important thing to do is we're going to define our x direction as being to the right. And then Anytime you have kind of a delta, 
So let's just take a step back. Let's look at a generic x coordinate. You have x and then x plus delta x. And the difference between them is delta x, right? And if you want to find delta x, that is x plus delta x minus x. And then typically we refer to the first x is x1 and the second x as x2. So delta x would also equivalently be x2 minus x1. Done this in calculus, probably most of your engineering classes. So we're going to apply the same um, kind of method to heat transfer problems. So we define our x as going right. Okay, so then that means that we're going to have t1 over here, t2 over here, x1, x2. And I'm just going to arbitrarily decide that t1 is going to be cold, t2 is going to be hot. I don't necessarily know that beforehand, maybe I do, maybe I know one of them, maybe I do or I don't know the direction of heat transfer. And then we're going to look at our Fourier's law equation. <coughs> delta t, t2 minus t1, delta x, x2 minus x1. So now, T2 minus T1, is that positive or negative? Because we know hot and cold. It's positive. X2 minus X1. Remember, this is zero. Right, so positive. Larger X minus smaller X. So our QX is going to be what? It's going to be negative. If we look back at our problem, hot and cold, what direction is heat going to flow? Right, from hot to cold. Qx is flowing in the opposite direction from how we've defined our positive x, so it's negative. Everything checks out. Okay? So, just to be extra rigorous, let's do a second example. And let's just say for fun we're going to make x go to the left because we can. It's fine. Because we have x going to the left, t1 and x1 are defined as being on the right side, right? T1, X1, T2, X2. And then I'll arbitrarily decide T1 is hot, T2 is cold. So let's go through Fourier's law again. Negative K A So delta T is going to be positive or negative? So remember, delta T is T2 minus T1. T2 minus T1, cold minus hot, is going to be negative. X2 minus X1, negative or positive? positive. This is the origin, so x1 is 0, x2 is some thickness. So that's going to be positive. So now, q of x is what? Positive. 
negative times a negative. And if we look back at our problem, heat's flowing in which direction? Hot to cold. Which is aligned with the direction that we've defined our positive x. So it's positive, flowing in the positive direction. Okay, so hopefully this kind of lets you know why we have this negative sign here. So we know that heat always flows from hot to cold, right? And if we define our x as being in the same direction, also going from hot to cold, then T2 minus 1 is always going to be negative. So we have to have that negative there to correct it and make the heat transfer in the positive direction. But again, heat flows from hot to cold. If we define our x direction as opposite of the heat flow, then T2 minus 1, uh, sorry, T2 minus 1 is going to be positive, and then we need to have that negative there to correct the direction of heat transfer, show that it's going to be negative. If you're still confused about this, you can write out like every single permutation of this problem and like flip your x around. I did this, right? Flip your x around, change the hot to cold, and it'll always work out right if you define it like this. Okay? So, that leads me to, because I want us to be consistent for everything that we've done and everything that we're doing for future problems. So, kind of the biggest things we need to clarify based on this, move this away, in our past notes, there's a couple things. So when we are first going through the, how Fourier's law was defined, we need to be a little bit more rigorous about how we're defining our positive x, okay? And I've like put in purple what I'm correcting here, and I'll put these online too. But if you want to correct it in your notes, you can do that. So here we're going to be rigorous about saying, okay, for this example, x is in the positive, a uh, positive x is to the right, so that makes this t1 x1, t2 x2. And then delta t, t2 minus t1, delta x, x2 minus x1. And t2 and t1 for a generic problem can be, you know, t1 can be hotter or colder and t2 can be hotter or colder. For this problem, Because we've defined Qx is going to the right, we know, let's see if I can get this right, we know that T2 is going to be less than T1 because heat is flowing in this direction. But we've kind of defined that beforehand. So we know one of them is going to be colder and one of them is going to be hotter and we know which direction that is. Okay. Is that all sitting all right? And then Fourier's law, where we were talking about that initially, specifically assigning one temperature is hotter and one temperature is colder is, is not a very rigorous way to go about it. You can get away with it if you're doing just a conduction problem because you're just kind of defining your x direction however you want and you're saying that flux is always positive or heat, heat rate is always positive. But when you're combining it with other modes of heat transfer and you have to be really rigorous about your definition of the coordinate system, you just define T2 and T1 as determined by your chosen coordinate system. So the x direction positive, T2 is going to be here, T1 here. Okay. Okay, hopefully that clears up some of that confusion. So that's just for conduction, right? And you can, you know, we can work an example problem and show that this is always true. I won't go through it, but take like the homework problem where we had the aluminum pan and X is like in the positive direction. You've got a pan on a stove um, and or heat is going in the positive direction up. You can define your X is going up, make the problem really easy. You can define your X is going down and you should still get the same answer. You just have to now account for the fact that you've kind of like flipped around what your T1 and your T2 are. And 
I wrote it out. We'll just look at it here real quick. So that's like if you do the problem like this. So remember this problem? This is 105. You don't know this temperature. You know, they tell you specifically that heat is going from the stove into the pan. So you know that the heat flux is going this way. And if we, we just want to define our positive x as going down, t2 minus t1, x2 minus x1. And now, because the x is going this way, this is t1, and then down below is t2. So now you have t2 minus t1, so you have the unknown minus the known. And you still get the same answer. <coughs> Just so long as you're consistent with how you're defining your x-coordinate and how you're defining your t1 and t2. And then, just to show you that it really does work, if you just, for some reason, decided that heat was going to be flowing from the pan into the stove, you're like, I just really want heat to flow this way, okay? And you set up your problem, t2 minus t1, x2 minus x1, all right, we've defined our x is going up in this direction, arbitrarily, so t1 is down here, t2 is up here. So now t2 minus t1 is 105 minus the unknown. What you're going to get is that the temperature is lower on the bottom. So the math is still giving you a physically correct answer. Because you've said that heat is flowing in this direction, what you're going to get from the problem is that, okay, well, this must be a lower temperature. Because in order for heat to flow this direction, you have to have hotter and colder. So this would be inconsistent with what the problem statement said. So it would be wrong because you were clearly told that he was flowing from the stove into the pan. So you should be able to tell that from the problem statement. But the math is still going to work out and give you a physically consistent answer. Again, if you're confused, go through like every single iteration of how you could set this up and it will make sense. Okay? Any questions? All right. Thumbs up. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Now, let's talk about how this works for convection. Okay, so for convection, we have a surface and then a fluid. We're going to define our x direction as being this way. And then that would mean that T1 is here, T2 is here. And because convection, you're always talking about a surface temperature and a fluid temperature, we're just going to go ahead and say, okay, T1 is the same thing as T surface and T2 is the same thing as T infinity, because it's often referred to as surface and infinity. So the only kind of weird thing about talking spatially, um, talking about this spatially for convection is that convection, you typically talk about it occurring just at a surface, right? So with conduction, you have like heat transfer through a wall, maybe that's of a finite thickness. But for convection, it's just really you're just talking about what is going on right here at the surface between the um, the wall and the flow, the airflow. And if you look at the equation for convection, there's no x term in there, right? There's no kind of distance because you're just talking about the heat rate at this surface. But we can still talk about, we can still define a coordinate system just for kind of getting our sign conventions correct. So just remember that this x here is just for figuring out our signs and the directions that everything is moving in. So note that there's a negative sign here. Okay, and often in the book, you'll just see this written as like Q equals HA times T naught minus T infinity or T infinity minus T naught. And that's just because they're just kind of going with an arbitrary direction. They're just saying like, oh, okay, if it's TS minus T infinity, then I'm just saying if heat is going 
you know, in this one direction, then it's positive, it's going the other direction, then it's negative. But if we're working with combined problems, with conduction and convection especially, and we need to be really sure about how we define our signs, then we need to use, or at least start with, kind of this version of the equation. So it's exactly analogous to what we were talking about before with conduction. T2 minus T1. And in this case, so here again, X is going in this direction, so we know T1, T2. And in this case, what's T2? We've defined it as being T infinity, and T1 is T surface. Oh, and then I should say, we're arbitrarily choosing this one's hot, this one's cold. So what's our delta T, the sign of our delta T gonna be? Negative. So what's the sign of our heat transfer? Positive. So let's see, hot, cold, Q is gonna be going this way from hot to cold. So yeah, Q's positive, it's lining up with our X direction. And then we could do another example where, you know, we have this same setup, but we flip X around and it would again be consistent. We would end up with Q being um, negative because X is now pointing this direction and Q is now going this direction. So X pointing to the left and then Q pointing to the right. So that negative would just mean, okay, it's opposite direction that we've defined as our positive X. Okay, still making sense? Okay. So now let's talk about a combined problem. So we have a wall and then some flow. We're gonna define X as being in this direction. So that means we've got X1, X2, T1, T2. And then we could call this T3 or T infinity. And T2 is also T surface. Yes. So T1, T2, which is the same as the surface temperature, because then we've got some flow over here, <coughs> and that has a fluid temperature of T infinity, which we can also call T3. Yes? So if you flip your X, T3 is now T1? Yep. Okay. <coughs> still T infinity? Um, yeah, it's still T infinity, yeah. But yeah, T1, 2, 3, which determines the direction that you plug it into the equation, that's determined by the direction that you define X. If you're always saying that delta is 2 minus 1 or 3 minus 2. Okay. So let's just say I want this to be hot. This is going to be a medium temperature and then cold. <coughs> Okay, so now we've got, we're just saying it's a super simple problem in that <coughs> the heat transfer of conduction through the wall is equal to the heat transfer via convection that's, that's leaving the wall. Okay, so we'll say Q conduction equals Q convection. So we define Q conduction. We've got our equation T2 minus T1 over x2 minus x1 equals negative h a now be careful because we've got three temperatures but it's still just you know three minus two and if we want to rewrite that using the nomenclature that we've 
decided on. T3 is T infinity, and T2 is T surface for convection. Okay. So, T2 minus T1, negative or positive? Medium temperature minus a hot temperature? Negative. X2 minus X1, positive. T infinity minus T surface. Cold minus medium, negative. So now we've got positive equals a positive. Perfect. So if we look at our problem, through the wall we've got hot and medium temperature. So Q conduction is going to be going in this direction. And then medium and cold, so convection, is going to be going this direction through the wall. So they're both aligned with the positive x direction, and they're both positive in sign. Okay, do you want to go through this where we flip the x sign? So we're all like really clear? No? You think you got it? Okay. All right. Good. So kind of the big takeaway from this is to be consistent, define a coordinate system and stick with it. And always be rigorous about defining your deltas as 2 minus 1. And your what's 2 and what's 1 depends on the direction that you define your coordinate system in. And if you're setting up a problem where the directionality of the heat transfer matters, you need to always use the versions of the equation where you have negative and then the delta is 2 minus 1, negative and the delta is 2 minus 1. <coughs> so this is kind of where it's really key that you understand where the equations for, come from and what assumptions are going into them. Because if you just like flip through the book and like pull out a random equation and try to apply it to a problem, then you're going to get confused. Okay. So, that leads us to making kind of one clarification about the convection boundary condition that we were talking about yesterday. So, if we're being rigorous about the directionality, then we need to say that the conduction boundary condition, so the, the transfer at the, the heat transfer at the surface due to conduction, and again this is flux, so the A's have been canceled out, but that's fine, is equal to negative H delta T, where again delta T is T2 minus T1. And T1 and T2 correspond to T surface and T infinity, so the temperature of the fluid, as determined by how you've defined your coordinate system. So just like we did in the example. Okay. Hopefully that clears things up on the sign convention. Everything's straightforward. If you're, you know, when in doubt, just even if it's a simple problem, a simple convection problem, just go ahead and define an X, pick your direction, and then stick with it, and then you'll always get the right sign. You should always get the right sign if you're doing it correctly. Okay, and again, I'll upload these corrected notes. Um, I, I'll just throw this up here real quick, up here real quick. I don't want to take the time to write it all out, but 
I can include this in like a handout and post it on Canvas so you guys just have it. Um, I'll also include the a handout for like Fourier's law written out and the heat diffusion equation written out in all three of the coordinate systems, Cartesian, cylindrical, and spherical. We haven't gone through the spherical derivation, so I won't ask you to do spherical problems, but if you just want to know, I'll put it on Canvas, okay? Um, and then I can also include this kind of list of nomenclature that we have so far. And then just a little kind of running summary of the equations that we've gone through, kind of what they look like and what, what they're used for. So the primary equations we've, we've talked about so far are first law, which is accounting for energy coming in and going out. The heat diffusion equation, which is the one with all the partials, where you know temperatures at the boundary, so you know boundary and initial conditions, and you define or you, you figure out the temperature distribution. And then Fourier's law, which is solving for the rate of heat transfer and that depends on dt dx, which you can get from the temperature distribution and from the heat diffusion equation. Okay, I saw like a little bit of confusion on that on the homework. Like, ask you to do a first law and you're like throwing the heat diffusion equation in there. Okay. So, got some time left. You guys want to go over homework number five? Problem number five? Okay. I hope that uh, whoever turned in their homework last wrote it out well. Pull it up on my computer, but. Okay, let's see. Okay, so we've got a window, <coughs> double pane, right? And then we had, this is five millimeters, 10 millimeters, and five millimeters. <coughs> glass, air, and glass. So the first part of the problem <coughs> was showing that the heat transfer rate Q in and Q out is the same in all three parts of the window. So I ask you to start with the first law on a rate basis. and told you in the problem that there was no change in stored energy, no change in energy generation. So that let you conclude that the energy in is the energy out. And it's a closed system, there's no work being done, so energy in and out is only due to heat transfer via conduction, okay? So, not dot. Just plain Q in equals Q out, okay? And that's kind of considering the system as a whole. So we're saying our control volume is the entire window. And then, I won't go through it specifically, but just to show that this is true, that the heat transfer is the same through all three panes of the window you can just put a control volume around this one, a control volume around this one, a control volume around this one separately and show that what comes in here has to go out there and then the same thing through all of the panes. Okay. So that was part A. Part B. So we know now that Q of the, I'm going to say, glass inner 
equals Q of the air equals Q of the glass outer, where this is our outside. This is our inside. And then we can express all three of these using Fourier's law. And on the problem I had, what was it? I think T1, 2, 3, and 4 going across like this. Yeah. Okay. So expressing all of them with Fourier's law, the um, heat transfer rate for the inner glass, negative K, A, and now our T2 minus T1. Let's just define our x in the direction of heat transfer, make it easy, 2 minus 1. Over the thickness, which I had is L1. And we know that's going to be equal to the heat transfer through the air, which was T3 minus T2. Over the thickness, L2 equals, again, the heat transfer through the outer glass, so T4 minus T3. Over L3, so the third thickness. Yes? Can you just talk a little bit more conceptually about how you know that the heat transfer rate is the same between each section? Sure, yeah. OK, so here we basically defined our control volume as being the entire window. Okay, so we're starting with that. Yeah. Control volume is the entire window. So then we just write the um, energy balance. We know that there's no energy gener generation or stored energy. Q in equals Q out. Okay, now let's take our problem and I think of the best way to draw this. Okay, glass, air, glass. And we know we have Q in and Q out and that they're equal. We showed that in the first part right here. Okay, now let's say our control volume is just this first pane. Okay, let's apply the first law to the first pane, okay? If there's no change in stored energy, um, so you do have to make an assumption that there's no change in stored energy or energy generation in each pane separately. Pretty standard assumption to make. It's what we've been kind of talking about for the entire problem, okay? So now again, E in equals E out. So we know already that the heat transfer in is Q in right here. And then that's equal to the heat that's going out of the other side. Okay, so Q in, and now we've got Q out over here, and we can label it like <coughs> Q glass in or out or something like that so we can kind of keep track of it. Okay, Q glass in or out. Okay, and then you do that for the second pane. It's literally just the same. Right, the yeah. You get the exact same thing and then so the glass um, or the, the heat going through this surface is equal to this one and through this surface is equal to this one and this one and this one and this one. Yep. Yes. And the other thing we assume here is that all of the heat transferring is going like across this way, and we can do that because um, the surface area of the big glass pane is a lot greater than the like five millimeter like strip on the top and the bottom. Yeah. We're so. Just assuming it's one dimensional. Yeah. So um, I think we mentioned in like the first or second <laughs> lecture that if you have. Um, you know, a wall or a window pane, and 
usually you can either assume that it's insulated on these ends but typically what you say is okay well this dimension is really small and the dimension into the page is really large where a is kind of the dimension into the page so then the heat transfer going in this direction is going to be way bigger than the heat transfer going in this direction kind of parallel to the the really small dimension that's a very standard assumption that we'll make a lot even if you know the wall is pretty thick we're still going to make that assumption otherwise we'd be dealing with two-dimensional heat transfer which we don't know how to handle okay cool any more questions Nope. Okay. Okay. So we can go back now that we've kind of already talked about convection a good amount. We can go back to where we left off last time. which was just talking about introducing convection. So rather than just talking about kind of what convection is with an equation, what actually physically is happening. Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't realize we were moving on. So I, in the homework you gave sure. a really neat tidy form, was that just some algebra magic that went through after you had those three equated to each other? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's just all algebra. Yes? Why did you write those three people in each other? Because you have Q and answers. So. But they're all Q, so it seemed like you wanted to do a substitution. Let's pull this back. If you equal them all to one generic Q, then you can do math. So let's say, okay, now we know that Q through the inner glass window is equal to Q through the air is equal to Q through the outer glass window, which is just equal to QX, the heat transfer rate, through the whole window. And then if we express each of these using Fourier's law for the specific temperature differences and thicknesses that we have for each window pane, that still all equals QX. So now we do some algebra and the final form of the equation only had T4 and T1 in it, right? It only had T1 and T4. So you basically use the fact that these all equal each other to solve for T3 and T2 which you don't know in terms of um, things that you do know, T1 and T4, right? Because we know that like this is 10 and this is negative 15, but we don't know the temperatures of the other ones. And since we want T1 and T4 in the final form of the equation, we need to solve for the other temperatures in terms of T1 and T4. And QX. And QX, yes. Yeah. So because this is equal to these, QX ends up being a part of what you're substituting in. But then you can rearrange everything and at the end, pull QX out and solve just for that. Because then QX is the only unknown that's left in your problem. Yeah, it's just algebra. Okay. And in the solution, which I'll post after class, I like go through step by step all the algebra and in general if you didn't understand any of the homework problems look at the solution it's written out pretty clearly okay any more problems not about convection cool so the reason the point of that problem was to show um, that the, the equation that you derived is kind of just like 
a generic equation that you'll see for heat transfer through like a composite wall. If you have like one type of material, another type of material, a different type of material. And that was to show that you can actually derive that equation from the first law pretty simply. And kind of the reasoning behind why you have, you know, why you'll see the like L over K plus L over K plus L over K in the denominator. Okay. So back to our discussion on convection. So again, we'll primarily be using convection as for now as a boundary condition on conduction problems. So I want you to have just kind of a physical understanding of what's going on when convection is occurring. So this is what we wrote down last lecture. So kind of picking back up here with, we were talking about how convection is a combination of <coughs> diffusion, which is heat being transferred by kind of the random motion of the atoms and molecules and advection, which is the bulk motion of the fluid. So in conduction, it's due just to the random motions and collisions of the atoms and molecules. In convection, you have this additional term advection where you've got energy being transferred with the fluid as it flows kind of macroscopically. Okay. So from fluids, you should know about boundary layers, right? A little bit about boundary layers. Okay. So <coughs> convection depends on what's happening in the boundary layer. It doesn't depend just on what's happening in the boundary layer, but it um, has a lot to do with, with how well something conducts or something convects heat. So let's say we have a solid surface. Solid surface down here. And then we have a flow that has speed U infinity and temperature T infinity. And then the solid surface is going to have a temperature TS. As flow moves from left to right, you're going to have a velocity boundary layer that develops from basically at the surface, the flow is going to be zero, right? Flow is zero at a solid surface, something you should have learned in fluids. This should look pretty familiar. And then as you move upward in the y direction, the flow increases in speed until it's equal to the flow of the free stream. And then right here, you, the flow speed is equal to zero, right where it's contacting the surface. So we have a velocity boundary layer. We also have a thermal boundary layer. So we'll see, say here that the surface is hotter than the fluid. So TS is greater than T infinity. So down here at the surface, there's going to be, the fluid is going to be equal to the temperature of the surface. And then up here, the fluid is going to be equal to the temperature of the flow. So that's our temperature boundary layer, yes. Yeah, so here we're just assuming we have like a flat plate that is infinitely long and that you're just going like up into the atmosphere where all of this flow in the atmosphere is just equal to T infinity uh, or equal to U infinity and T infinity. Okay, so we've got a velocity distribution, so how the temperature varies with Y and then a temperature <coughs> distribution, how the temperature varies with Y.
Okay, we'll leave that here. And then it's Wednesday, so I'll have homework posted this afternoon. Um, and it'll be primarily covering uh, kind of stuff that we've already talked about with the heat diffusion equation.